Welcome to Weekly Pulse, I'm Mackenzie Salmon. The NFL Draft was the closest thing we've had to real sports in a while, and it went pretty smoothly. So, how did teams do? We'll give you our analysis as well as a look ahead to the NFC and the AFC. Then, we're talking to Bengals Hall of Famer Anthony Munoz. He gives us his thought on what the future looks like for his former team now that they've acquired star quarterback Joe Burrow out of LSU. Let's roll. Well, time to put a wrap on the 2020 NFL Draft. You know what that means. Report cards. Time for some knee-jerk reactions. Just a couple days after the three-day event's over, so let's get to analyzing it. And let's start with the league itself. Uh, 55 million viewers uh, gave everybody that's uh, shacked up at home something to do during this pandemic. Uh, it was great to have the distraction. Roger Goodell, obviously, some awkward interviews, butchered a few names, as he always does. Sorry, Tua. Sorry, Caleb Vaughn. Uh, but, you know, welcomed us into his home, as did the other coaches, uh, general managers, and 58 of the players. Um, you know, pretty pretty good production, uh, interesting access. Uh, loved, loved spending some time in Cl Cliff Kingsbury's house. Uh, so I think overall, you know, plus, plus you know, great, great job by ESPN uh, pulling it all together remotely. Uh, let, let's give the league an A- uh, for overall satisfaction of this draft. I have to say my favorite draft, um, give the Indianapolis Colts an A. Uh, you know, to get running back Jonathan Taylor, a guy that averaged 2,000 yards rushing in three seasons at Wisconsin, uh, and Michael Pittman Jr., the USC wide receiver, both in the second round, um, guys who were borderline first round picks, uh, that's pretty nice value. Uh, they come back and get Washington quarterback Jacob Eason in the fourth. A lot of people liked him, uh, tremendous upside. Um, also, you know, the potential for, for, uh, for a low floor for him, but uh, to get him in round four, um, put him behind Phillip Rivers and then let, let him learn and see what he can develop into. I think it's a nice, low-risk, high-reward investment by Chris Ballard at that point. Uh, and don't forget, you know, they give up the 13th pick for uh, 49ers defensive tackle to force Buckner to anchor the defense. Uh, that's a really nice use of draft capital. A couple A minuses. You know, I think both the Cincinnati Bengals uh, and Washington Redskins deserve some credit. Uh, they didn't overthink Joe Burrow at number one for Cincinnati, Chase Young at number two for the Redskins when they reportedly had an offer on the table to trade that. Uh, take those guys, uh, build around them. Uh, both excellent players, uh, uniquely suited to help. Um, you know the specific situations for each franchise. You know, and the, and the Bengals got other nice players. You know, T. Higgins uh, should, should be a very nice receiver for them. Maybe replaces A.J. Green long term. Uh, and, and the Redskins also, you know, ni nice job finally re bringing resolution to the Trent Williams situation and getting something back for him. You know, this wasn't the new regime's problem, but 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 they fixed it. And, and you know, the Redskins also another team that, that did not have a second round pick this year. Um, but that's because they got Montez Sweat uh, in the first round last year. And I think overall that's an investment they're going to be glad that they made. One other A-minus, uh, let's give one to the Dallas Cowboys, who did not overthink the fact that C.D. Lamb was sitting there at number 17. Uh, they did not need a receiver, uh, but I don't think you can pass up uh, arguably, be, arguably the best one in the draft at that point. Uh, and all of a sudden your number one offense looks that much better with, uh, with C.D. Lamb paired next to, to Amari Cooper uh, in, in what should be a dynamic offense. So, Nice job by the Cowboys, and Bradley and I too. Uh, nice pickup uh, on day three with an edge rusher that they really needed. The bottom of the barrel, you know, a couple Ds. Let's talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, you know, first off, didn't love the Jalen Rager pick with their first round uh, selection. I would have taken Justin Jefferson at that point. You know, the Eagles got plenty of speed later. I would have preferred the polished guy you could play in the slot. Uh, and then Jalen Hurts, you know, he, he's an interesting prospect uh, for sure. Um, but to take him in the second round when you had other holes on your roster, I think it's a questionable decision. Uh, and then the Green Bay Packers, uh, taking Jordan Love, you know, usually no problem laying the groundwork for, for a quarterback successor for Aaron Rodgers, but I still think he's got plenty left in the tank. Lastly, I failed the Houston Texans. Uh, and not necessarily because I didn't like the players they took. I just don't like the way that Bill O'Brien used his draft assets. Uh, he traded Jadavian Clowney last year, only got a third rounder. Uh, trades DeAndre Hopkins this year, only gets uh, a second rounder, uh, and then he used so many of his picks on players like Brandon Cooks and Duke Johnson, Gary and Conley, Laramie Tunsil. You know, Tunsil's a good player, they needed a left tackle, but they gave up two first round picks and a second for him. Uh, I think the Texans are really going to be sorry uh, in the not too distant future for when they have to pay the piper uh, for all this draft capital that they mismanaged. It wasn't conventional. 
It was pretty much all virtual, but it was always exciting. Minus Cam Newton and Jameis Winston's next home, everything feels pretty much set for the NFC after free agency in the draft. So let's overreact to the offseason in the NFC. We start down south. Drew Brees considered retiring, then didn't. They added Emmanuel Sanders and drafted Cesar Ruiz. They're going for it. What do you say to people when they say that window is closing? We are, I think we are in the window. In their way, Tom Brady in Tampa Bay. Yeah, I'm not gonna call it that. He brought back Gronk and they're going for it too. Panthers hit the reset button with some basic rules. Cam's out, CMC's paid. Teddy takes over. The Falcons have new unis, added Todd Gurley in free agency and AJ Terrell in the draft. But does Gurley still have two knees? Two teams still stand above the rest in the East, Dallas and Philly. The Eagles added Darius Slay, drafted the next to Sean Jackson, and invested in some insurance if Wentz gets hurt. Dallas basically lost their whole defense in free agency, but decided who needs one anyways? The addition of CeeDee Lamb gives Mike McCarthy an insane offense. First one to 40 wins. The Redskins have been chasing relevancy forever. Maybe they found it? Probably not though. Gone is Eli in New York. In is Danny Dimes, Joe Judge, and a haul of good draft picks. Maybe Gettleman isn't the Jersey Jerry Krause. In the North, it's unclear who's the king. The Bears look primed to move on from Trubisky with Foles in the picture, but how much better is that really? Can someone check in on Aaron Rodgers during quarantine? Because the Packers clearly didn't ask for his opinion. The Vikings extended Kirk Cousins, traded Stephon Diggs, drafted Justin Jefferson, and I think, I think they have the best roster in the division. The Lions probably have the worst. Jeff Akuda and DeAndre Swift should help, but what's the deal with Matthew Stafford? Remember him? And remember when the Rams were the class of the West? Yeah, that's not the case anymore. The Niners look to avoid the Super Bowl hangover and they have the roster to do it. As long as Seattle has Russell Wilson, they have a Super Bowl shot too. And don't sleep on the Cardinals. DeAndre Hopkins and Isaiah Simmons will make sure of it. Think about this in the AFC. Peyton Manning is long gone, Brady just left, and Big Ben is chopping wood on a mountain somewhere. This conference has gone to the kids. Let's overreact to the free agency and draft moves made in the AFC. Let's start with the champs. Mahomes may be envious of others' interior designs, but he's about to become the first $200 million man in the NFL. But the Chiefs' salary cap is still waiting for that stimulus check. They did keep their core intact and got a legit running back in the draft. They got the league on lock. Speaking of lock, Drew's got something to say. The Broncos put on for the draft in free agency, adding Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler and signing Melvin Gordon. It's a good bet they make some noise. If we are taking bets, the Las Vegas Raiders are hedging theirs by keeping Derek Carr the starter, I think. Let's hope Henry Ruggs is more than just fast. Some people think you're just a deep ball threat. I feel like I'm a complete receiver. On the bright side, they build a giant Roomba to clean up their mess. Speaking of a mess, LA Chargers. Where are they even playing? Does anyone care? If Justin Herbert falls in an empty stadium, does it make a sound? And I need to sound off on the Texans. What are they doing? If I'm Deshaun Watson, I'm jumping ship. You want to talk jumping ships? The Jacksonville Jaguars. When Ramsey got traded during the season, did that so that the era was kind of closing and ending in Jacksonville? Yeah, definitely. It's all the draft picks though. I'm jumping on the Colts ship as they look primed to rebound. They welcomed Phillip Rivers with open arms and a stacked offense. Quick trivia. Did you know the Titans made the AFC Championship game last year? Yeah, me neither. They signed Ryan Tannehill to a long-term deal. Why? and why the Patriots drafted a kicker before drafting a quarterback will never make sense to me. This season for New England looks like it's going to the dogs. The Dolphins made a splash and got their franchise quarterback. Tanking season over. The Bills should be taking over this division. The additions of Stephon Diggs and second round still AJ Epinesa solidify that. As for the Jets, moving on. Quick take, the Browns might actually live up to expectations this year since there are no expectations again. Hot take. I think the Steelers should consider moving on from Big Ben, but they won't. Just like his beard, this has gone on too long. Potter take. The Bengals could be sneaky good. Joe Burrow with AJ Green, Joe Mixon, Tyler Boyd, and T Higgins is nothing to laugh at. Hottest take, Madden curse is no more. Coverboy Mahomes proved that. Lamar will do the same.
Derek Jeter, Larry Walker, and the rest of the 2020 Baseball Hall of Fame class will have to wait an extra year before their magic moment in Cooperstown. The Hall of Fame announcing that this year's ceremony has been postponed due to the coronavirus outbreak that has delayed the start of the Major League Baseball season and closed the Hall of Fame to the public. So Jeter, Walker, Ted Simmons, and the late Marvin Miller will all have their ceremonies pushed to next season when they'll be joined by any additional members who were elected this winter as baseball has its Hall of Fame ceremonies in late July of 2021. That will mark the first time since 1949 that multiple classes will be inducted at once. So who could join them? Well, it's probably not likely we'll see too many. Kurt Schilling is the leading returning vote getter who had 70% of the balloting last year. And the first time class members are pretty slim as well. The top candidates, pitcher Mark Burley and outfielder Tori Hutter. I'm Steve Gardner, and that's what I'm hearing. Chess boxing is a hybrid sport, combining the board game chess with the combat sport boxing. And you alternate rounds between the two until there is either checkmate or knockout. So if you and I were chess boxing, we would start out on the chess board with a three minute round of speed chess. So every time I make a move, I hit a timer that's counting down. When I hit my timer, now your timer's counting down and it's your move. When those three minutes are up, the referee pauses the timer, takes the board away, and we have one minute to put on gloves and get ready to box. We box for three minutes. We're knocking each other in the head, in the body. We're getting our heart rate up. And after three minutes of boxing, we have one minute to take off our gloves, calm ourselves down, sit back down at the board, and pick up the game where we left off. In the 2018 World Championship Finals, I fought a Korean guy. His big strength was he had been boxing for about 10 years longer than I had. And we were about equivalent in chess. And I came out pretty aggressive, and he was really cool, calm, collected, dropped right back, hit me with a counter with his very first punch that stunned me. I was like, uh oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble here. And there was one big punch that I landed right before the end of the round that I think gave me a, a big advantage. I, I caught him with a right hook and, and I knew I did damage. And like a second or two later, the bell rang for the end of the round. I'd say the biggest challenge is in that transition though. I knew going into the world championship, I wasn't gonna be the best chess player and I wasn't gonna be the best boxer. So what I decided to try to win was the minute of transition. He comes back to the board and the very first move that he makes is he picks up a white rook and he moves it down the G file. I, I look at my king and I look at his king and I'm like, I'm definitely the white pieces. Like he picked up the wrong colored piece and moved it down the board. Like this is good news. And the referee noticed it around the same time I noticed it. He moved the, the rook back and I was like, this is it. Like this is my shot. I gotta be really aggressive on the board right now. And right before the end of the third chess round, right before we have to go back into boxing, I end up checkmating him. He had like two, 300 people in his corner, like chanting his name and everything. And I had three American guys in my corner. <laughs> like, yeah, go Matt. And it was one of the best moments of my life. The most robust programs and events are in London and Paris. And they're, they're like top tier in terms of entertainment, lighting, professional hosts, live streaming to multiple countries, all that kind of stuff that you would see in other sporting kind of events. So I think that this is a beautiful yin and yang and it's multifaceted. And I think that's really exciting to, to watch and be a part of. Drone racing is a sport where you take high speed drones and you put a camera on the front and that camera broadcasts a signal back to a pair of goggles that the pilots wear. And it lets the pilot see what the drone is seeing. It's like sitting in the cockpit of the drone. And so the drones can co navigate complex three-dimensional courses at incredible speeds. The Drone Racing League has been around for five years. And for five years, we've elevated the sport of drone racing to a professional level. We've broadcast incredible competitive racing around the world, reaching tens of millions of fans. People spend a lot of time trying to figure out where to, how to categorize drone racing. Is it an e-sport? Is it a regular sport? Is it a racing sport? We like to categorize it as a robotic sport. So ultimately, when you come to a drone race, the, the thing that's on the field of play competing is a robot. It's being remotely controlled by a human. And so it is really unique in that way. And, it, and it, the robot is on the field of play actually performing the sport. And we think that's the defining characteristic of our sport. We wanted this to be one of the major sports uh, in the world of global competitions. Uh, you can expect us to see more large live audience events, 
more broadcasts around the world. We'll continue to do innovative things with the interesting blurry line between the digital sport and the real sport and keep crossing that over. And really, you know, we are building the world's first globally televised robotic sport. We are very excited to be announcing uh, Rachel Jacobson as the new president of the Drone Race. Rachel uh, spent over 20 years at the NBA, rose up through the ranks, uh, finished her time there as one of the top executives in the league. So she has been one of the top executives at maybe the most influential sports league in the world. Um, she also spent time uh, at a startup, uh, so she knows the early space environment. And so she's come here to the Drain Leasing League to bring that incredible experience in the sports world, her understanding of fast paced, innovative startups and bring it together to help accelerate the Drone Racing League to the next echelon of sports. This draft, I think you could agree, uh, will always be defined by Joe Burrow and what he was able to do. And you told Forbes you think Burrow can be the guy. What qualities does he have that you think makes him that guy? I mean, the guy's been amazing on the field, the poise, the, uh, you know, just uh, how accurate he is. And then I hear about his smarts, uh, being able to diagnose defenses here and being able yeah. to, to really look at him and do that. And then of course, uh, you know, when you're an Ohio kid, you get drafted to Ohio team that's been struggling. We've been struggling to get people in the stands. And I think this is really a great piece to this whole puzzle is you get a guy, not only a Heisman Trophy winner, the first pick, but he's an Ohio guy. So that's going to help put people in the seat. So that's, uh, and I mean, the guy is just, every big game he's played even better. The bigger the game, the, the better he's played. And from my perspective, at least for, for me, I think there's a lot to like on paper about the Bengals roster this year. They. They got uh, AJ Green, healthy AJ Green, T Higgins. They got Joe Mixon, Jonah Williams coming back from injury. For you personally, from your experience, how quickly do you think they can turn this around with that roster? Well, I'm pretty patient, so hopefully this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I'm you know, pretty it's, patient. I, <laughs> you know, they've got some young guys, but they have some experiences, guy, experienced guys coming in. You know, you hope that uh, you can. The main thing I want to see is I want to see a lot of progress this year. I don't want to yeah. see a, you know, hey, you signed all these free agents. You have a supposedly a great draft class and go three and 13. Uh, you know, I remembered back to when I first got here, we went to uh, four and 12, two years in a row. My rookie year, we go six and 10. But you could see the major improvement Super Bowl the year after that, 12 and four. So if we can see a lot of improvement with a lot of these guys, a lot of pro progress being made and you know, maybe go 500 or better. I think that's going to be a, a win for this draft for the free agent. Uh, but you never know. I mean, you never know what's going to happen with other teams and injuries. And it might be one of those things where the chemistry just works out well and, and bang, you're in the playoffs. And speaking of how things look on paper, the I think a good example or something I wanted to bring up definitely was the Browns were the hype team last year and obviously <laughs> didn't necessarily live up to expectations this past season. Is that a lesson the Bengals can take if and when they start to show some promise? I think it's a big lesson for any team that you don't uh, believe all the writing, all the things you read, <laughs> to believe all the people, yeah. what people are saying. I mean, I have a ton of Cleveland Brown fans that were already, uh, you know, confirming <laughs> their hotel rooms in Miami. And I kind of like uh, you know, Lee Corso on, uh, on game. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I think I think there were some things there that I really questioned as a football guy looking at that football team. Yeah. And it was kind of like when I was playing, when they got rid, when the Browns got rid of Marty, Marty Schottenheimer as, a, as an opponent, I said, thank you for doing that. He was one of the best coaches <laughs> I've seen. And when they got rid of Greg Williams and, and put in their, their new head coach, I was thinking yeah. they might have a lot of talent, but I don't know if that's the right move to, to get that, uh, you know, head coach out of it. It was a little nuts. But he had them playing like <laughs> unbelievably. And uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's it's a lesson that every team can can learn from. And again, you know, all the hard work that goes into preparing. So don't uh, in, don't you know believe what you read. Don't believe hey, you're you're ranked this, you're ranked that. You still have to go through camp. You have to go through the preseason and you have to still win football games. Yeah. And with with people saying, you know, the the Bengals might not have enough supporting cast around Burrow. I feel like on paper it seems like the opposite. Did it bother you at all? People saying that it does because uh, you know you mentioned some names. Joe Mixon. I mean, not a bad running back. He's a stud. In fact, you know, Gio is kind of there with them. Bernard, uh, AJ Green. You know, it looks like he's had plenty of time. One of the top, I'd say, one of the top five wide receivers in the league. Uh, so but you know, the main thing again, you know, the offensive line. But I think they have the pieces in the offensive line to be pretty good. So it's a matter of you know, really developing those guys. Uh, so when people say he didn't have the uh, supporting cast, I don't agree with that.
You were like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's like, wait. All right, let's see. Who are you going to give up? A.J. Green over who? Exactly. I don't think so. Joe Mixon. I don't Yo. think there's many running backs that would take over Joe Mixon. Yeah. And with Tom Brady gone in the AFC and Big Ben in the twilight of his career, it feels like there's sort of a power shift in the conference with a lot of younger quarterbacks coming up. Maybe, no. uh, who do you may, maybe see as like the next Patriots or Steelers Colts? Where does this young Bengals team fit in with this new era? You know, it's hard to say because we do have, uh, you know, you look at the Ravens and of course Lamar Jackson's proven yep. at least for a, a short period of time. You know, you have, uh, you know, I have the Buffalo Bills with their big, strong quarterback. So we're, we're dealing with some young guys. So uh, on paper, I think we have a chance. I'm not going to say, hey, we're yeah. going to, you know, be right up there and win the division right away. But you, again, you never know. I mean, you know, history and I know, you know, eras are different, uh, times are different, but we were 4-11 and 11 in 87 and people didn't give us the chance in 88. And all we did was start out 6-0. and We went 12-4 and home field advantage and went to Super Bowl 23. And not a whole lot of people picked us to even win the AFC Central at the yep. time, which is now the AFC North. So, you know, again, I've never been pretty good in predicting. So uh, I'm going to stay with just saying, you know, this team has a chance to compete. Uh, you know, Miami, they got a, a new young quarterback. They got some, you know, they had a pretty good draft. They got some linemen, a quarterback in Tua. So uh, I think Tom Brady leaves. Ben is getting up there in his in his career. But uh, again, you have teams that have restocked, reloaded with some really good young quarterbacks, and I think we fall right into that, uh, right into that group of uh, getting ourselves a real good, excellent young quarterback. Mm -hmm. And you, after you retired from the NFL, you chose to stay and live in Cincinnati. What was your reasoning behind that? First thing I say, I say, you know, palm trees and the beach are overrated in Southern California. <laughs> you know, I, I hate that sand in my shoes, but. Uh, no, I first thing I say is the people. I mean, yeah. I debated, you know, I really contemplated. A week after my last game, I had a job offer in LA to coach the line at USC, which I still love the place and and then or either go into broadcasting and uh, you know, our kids were 9 and 11 and and we decided to stay here and, and go the broadcasting route. No regrets uh, 27 28 years ago turning that job down at USC and staying here. This is home. I tell people I'll never say never, but it would take something drastic to get us out of Cincinnati. What do the other draft picks have to look forward to once they move to Cincinnati? Are there any really good restaurants you'd recommend? Uh, well, I'll like tell you what, you, know, <laughs> you, you can look at me. I mean, there's no lack of good food here. You know, you, if you want a steak, uh, I, I choose one of the Jeff Ruby steak houses. <laughs> and not only steak, but they have great seafood bars. They got, you know, some yep. rubies. Of course, you have Montgomery Inn. If you like ribs, Montgomery Inn. Their Saratoga chips. Uh, then if you need a little dessert, go to UDF or to go to Grader's Ice Cream. If Joe brings a winning tradition to the Bengals, you mentioned how much he would mean to the city, but as far as it, in the organization to the Bengals, what would he mean if if he were to help bring that winning tradition? Uh, I think it's huge. I think it's huge. Anytime you, you know, you own a team and, you know, regardless of what the noise is out there, but, uh, you know, if you can, uh, you beat the Ravens and the Browns and the Steelers and win the division and win the conference and, and get into the playoffs or the Super Bowl, I think it's great for the organization. I think, uh, you know, I don't think you would be in this business if you weren't competitive and you didn't want to win and you didn't want to be number one. So I think uh, not only for the organization, but for the coaches and the other guys. And, you know, for the former players, we have, I'd say, probably conservatively 40 to 50 guys that live in this area that I played with and that played here one time or another. And we're still big fans and we experience playoffs. We experience Super Bowl. And we want that for these guys. We want the city to go nuts like they did when the, when the jungle was established back in the early 80s. And so you want these guys to experience that same thing. That's it from us at Weekly Pulse, your heartbeat to what's trending in sports. Hey, sports fans. If you want to see more videos like this, check out some of our other ones right here. And if you like what you see, hit the subscribe button and stick around for more from USA Today Sports.